So uh, last time we talked about uh, two-slit interference, this idea that if you have two slits, you can send waves, uh, and uh, waves come through each of them, and they interfere. Now I'm going to have single-slit interference. So instead of just having, uh, uh, instead of having two slits, I'm just going to have a single slit. So everything else being the same, here we have the thing where our slit is located. Here we have some kind of observation screen. Um, once again, just the same as before, I'm going to call the distance from the slit to the screen capital L. I'm going to call the center of the screen, this is y equals zero as far as uh, measuring distance along the screen. It's also theta equals zero. So if I want to talk about what I see on the screen, I could talk about it in terms of physical distance, y, or I could talk about it in terms of uh, angle as well. The only difference is that now, instead of having two slits, I have just one slit, and that has a width w. So I don't want to write it right on top of the slit, because it's going to block the rest of my picture, but that has a width w. So that's the distinguishing from d, which was the distance two slits, now we have w, which is the width of one slit. Um, and so once again, I'm going to source a bunch of waves coming in, drawing the rays, drawing the wave fronts. But of course, your first question might be, well, if there's only one slit, what is there to interfere, right? Before we had two slits, and the whole idea was that the light from one slit interfered with the other. Well, what happens here is, yes, we have a single slit, but the single slit has finite width. So when one of these wave fronts comes in, um, like so, we can imagine that there's actually a bunch of uh, parts of the wave that make it through, because the slit has finite width. And so, what we're actually going to have is that light from one part of the slit interferes with light from a different part of the slit. So now we have one slit of finite width. Before, what we had was two slits of separation D, but we basically thought of them as being infinitely narrow, so only one wave could get out of each one. So before, we had two slits each being uh, very, very narrow, such that only one wave really got through each one. So one wave from each slit. Now what we're saying is that we only have one slit, but that slit has finite width, and so waves from one part can interfere with waves from another part. So and ironically, what we're doing is we're going from two slits down to one slit, but we have more interference than before. So what you have here is that when each part of the wave arrives, you can think of, for instance, as like this guy right here, that used to be right here. I like to think of wave fronts as kind of like soldiers marching shoulder to shoulder. So they're kind of cramped in on both sides, but then when you get to the slit, this part of the wave, it doesn't have any part that is next to it because it got blocked by the barrier, and so now it can have a chance to spread out to one side. So what happens is this guy will spread out, and, if, and so will this guy. And of course, if they spread out on the flanks there, then the waves in between also have room to spread out. So, as you can imagine, this is going to be quite complicated. And in a certain sense, it's really beyond the scope of the class. So I'm going to have to definitely hand wave a couple steps here as to how, how we're going to calculate this. First of all, how many waves do we have? Well, the more waves we can take, the more accurate it will be, right? So these are really infinitely narrow, there can be considered to be a wave coming from each part of the slit. So if we maybe took 10 waves across the width of the slit, 
that might be a good approximation, but 20 would be better, or 100, or 1,000, or a million. And this is the kind of thing that calculus is made for, is chopping up things into very, very small pieces and then adding them back together. We don't obviously, this is not a calculus-based physics class, but I'm just going to have to tell you a couple of the things along the way, and you're just going to have to believe me that that's how it works out. But I do want to point out the big feature of this, which is that this interference pattern will not only appear directly in front of the slit, it does spread out. So that is a tendency that waves have, they have a tendency to bend around corners. Okay. So even though you might think the only light that gets through here is through the slit, because you've taken out the light that hit the barrier on the sides, the light that does make it through has a chance to spread out again. Okay. So we have that uh, the waves bend around the corners. This is a feature seen in all waves. Okay. So for instance, you see these in water waves too. If you're swimming uh, right behind a barrier, trying to avoid waves, uh, you will notice that the water waves do bend around that barrier and you get lifted up and down even though you think you shouldn't get anything. Okay? Um, this actually gets a name, this is called diffraction. So diffraction is just a fancy word for when waves bend around some kind of barrier. Sometimes you'll have this also called single slit diffraction. Okay? So, um, let me work out the details of this to the extent that I can, and then I'll tell you why it is that we would um, want to even talk about this phenomenon when it's really in some ways beyond the scope of the class. Um, so, we again introduce approximation number one out of two, and before you get worried, these are going to be the exact same ones, basically, as for the, the double slit. Our approximation here is L is much, much greater than W. So we're assuming that the distance from the slit to the screen is far greater than the width of the slit itself. So, um, so I guess, conceptually, what we're doing is we're making sure that the distance from the slit to the screen is much larger than the slit width. And what that means is that basically we are going to have once again approximately parallel light. Okay? So this is basically what's going to look like this. So we have the slit there, we have the screen, and we have basically we're going to have to compute some kind of interference at some part of the screen from all the different waves that contribute from all different parts of the slit. But if we can say that they're approximately parallel, because otherwise they couldn't uh, go travel a very long distance, L, and arrive and interfere, and interfere at the, the same place. So we have a bunch of light coming from almost the same spot, traveling a very long distance, and interfering at the screen, and they're gonna have to be about parallel for that to happen. And so then we can once again quantify that the angle that they basically all go out at is theta, and the mathematical uh, implication here is that, as we sh shown before, the path difference is approximately d sine, uh, sorry, not d sine theta, that's how similar it is, w sine theta. So you can see it's exactly the same approximation, and why do we do it? We want the spread to be enough to see the, the uh, pattern that's going to form with visible light with the naked eye. Okay. So here's where I have to tell you 
um, a little bit about what we're going to see. It turns out that if you look at the very center of the screen, you might expect, of course, we're going to get constructive, right? Because everything can line up there. At the center of the screen, it looks like this. If you pair up the, um, the light from the two different parts of the slit, that, or the two edges of the slit, of course, they travel the same distance to get there. If they're lined up at the slit, they'll be lined up at the destination, right? And if you pair up this one and this one, well, of course, those also are lined up at the slit. They'll be lined up at the destination because they didn't have any uh, dif difference in transit length. And you can, of course, pair them up in this way, going all the way down the line. And we figure there must be a constructive at the center of the screen. And there is. Okay. So here's where you have to um, work out the math. And in some sense, it's quite challenging. So I'm gonna, just going to tell you the result. It turns out that they do cancel when you go away from that. So somehow all those waves coming from different parts of the slit all manage to kill each other. And then they do make a comeback. But there's a caveat. While they do grow again to reinforce each other, it's not quite as strong as in the center. So it will grow to be a local maximum, but it's kind of like when you're, you know, your favorite, uh, you know, your favorite uh, rock group reforms, and you kind of squint and go, "That's not all the original members, right?" It's not quite as good as it used to be. Okay, so that's kind of how it goes on down the line. It does alternate between bright and dark, but with diminishing returns. And again, I can't really tell you why exactly that is, but the pattern kind of looks like this. It's a bright, dark, sort of bright, dark, bright, so it kind of fades away. So it's not like the, the double slit where it just alternates like clockwork between bright and dark. It, it, the, the brights are ever diminishing. So let me go ahead and sketch that in the right orientation or kind of the orientation that's nice to look at. So I can plot versus the intensity versus y. So y is the y-axis is like this. So it looks like this. So diminishing returns. You can kind of think of it as like someone's throwing a blanket over it like this, so that these peaks do fade out. Um, I guess I can, before too long, I, I can just show you one of these, and you can believe me that they do fade out. So let me demonstrate here. I'm going to just fire the, my laser pointer. I'm going to put it through a slit. And there you have it, right? See that? So you see that there it does have the brightest spot in the middle, then it fades out to darkness, and then it does come back a little bit, but it fades out, right? I missed the light here, I guess. Let me just try to. I know this this doesn't even show up that well on camera as is, so there's the pattern. Like so. Um, So let's see what we can do about this. So here's where a little trickery comes in. We said that delta L equals M lambda before, that used to be constructive, right? Or that was constructive for the two slip. That's when the path difference was a whole number of um, wavelengths. So if you shift a wavelength onto another wavelength, they just line up again. Whereas if the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths plus an extra half, you get destructive. Okay? 
The only difference is that now when we say delta L, what we really mean is that the path taken by the light at the top of the slit versus the light taken, path taken by the light at the bottom, right? So we're comparing, instead of just this and this, we have to remember there's a whole bunch of waves in between too, right? Just not to, we're not really just comparing two anymore. We're, there's a whole bunch of other ones in between. We're just taking the two waves that are the furthest apart. Okay? And again, what we said was delta L, in this case, instead of being D sine theta, it's W sine theta. Well, I have to unfortunately report something to you. Oh, and I guess I should list the M values. So I have to tell you something. The fact that it isn't just these two waves, the waves coming from the top and bottom of the slit, but there's a whole bunch of waves in between too, that really mucks things, things up. We're not really interfering just two waves. We're interfering a bunch of them in between. Here's how it messes things up. Okay. This right here is not the constructive formula, it's the destructive. And the other one you might think, is it reversed? Is it just the constructive and destructive reversed? No, this doesn't actually give you anything. So obviously, something very different is going on. Why is that? Well, again, the reason why is that you're not just interfering two waves, it's a bunch of waves in between as well, and that can be very difficult to figure out how to account for. So, our equation here is going to be simply W sine theta equals M lambda gives you the destructive spots, okay? Now, you're going to have to just take my word for that, but there is a catch already. There's got to be one more amendment, and this one we can infer. Here's what happens. If I plug in m equals 0 here, that tells me that at theta equals 0, I should have a destructive. Obviously not true. I have a big constructive. In fact, that's my biggest, brightest spot in the whole pattern. Well, we're just going to have to disallow m equals 0 from this equation because it doesn't work. So those are the end of the amendments. You just have to take my word for it. This equation gives the destructive, not the constructive, and we have to disallow m equals 0. Okay? So that's the destructive for the single slit pattern. And again, use m values that are excluding 0. Don't ask me why, because I have no way of telling you why that is without using some calculus, okay? But if you can accept that, we're off and running with finishing up this whole thing um, by making our second approximation. It's the same exact approximation as before. And that approximation is we look at small angles. So the concept of that is we only look at the pattern near the center of the screen. Here it should be obvious why we only care about near the center of the screen, because clearly the pattern fades away when we get more than a few degrees off of the center anyway. You, the, and peaks drop in intensity, and at some point that intensity drops so much that we can't even see it anymore. Um, the math of that, again, as we did before, well, there starts to be no difference between a sine and a tangent, and that's useful because right now there's a sine in our equation, but we can express using tangent, we can relate the angular location to the physical meters location of where we see these things. 
So Kanjin is our gateway to relate the angular location theta with the physical distance location y. And with impunity, we can plug in what's the tan of theta into sine of theta if we are willing to keep the angle small. And the reason why, of course, is because the uh, single slit intensity peaks drop off anyway, anyways, at larger angle. And we are first and foremost interested in seeing this pattern with the naked eye for visible light. So we don't really care about the pattern beyond that. Okay. So if that's the case, let's go ahead and finish this up. Sine of theta is we're going to say is about y over l. And that gives us y equals m lambda l over w as my y values that I can expect to find my destructive interference. So let's go ahead and just plug in some values and find out what we get. Remember, 0 is disallowed, because if we plugged in m equals 0, we'd get y equals 0. And y equals 0 is not a dark spot. It's the brightest thing in the whole pattern. So we have to start with 1. We plug in m equals 1. And that will give us the location here, which is plus lambda l over w. We plug in m equals 2. And we'll get that this is plus 2 lambda l over w. And this is our map for finding the destructive. If we plug in m equals negative 1, we'll get this. Minus lambda l over w, etc. Minus 2 lambda l over w. So this is our map for finding where are the dark spots. So you might ask, well, what about the bright spots? It seems like they're roughly equally spaced. Why is it just reverse condition, right? They were equally spaced before. They kind of seem equally spaced now. Well, you know, if someone held a gun to your head and asked you to find this, yes, it's about halfway in between. Okay? So it wouldn't be horribly wrong to use the opposite formula for opposite purpose. The only reason it doesn't exactly work is for the following reason. Imagine you had a nice mound of sand built up here between two locations like that. And you made it nice and symmetric so that the peak of that pile of sand was exactly between here and here. And then someone comes along and steps on it. And they don't step on it like this and smoosh it down symmetrically. They step on it like this, whoosh, right? Look at this envelope, right? It goes like this. So if someone steps on it asymmetrically, they're going to shift the peak a little bit this way, right? See what I'm saying? So if you took the exact halfway point, this is actually shifted slightly. That's why it doesn't exactly work that way. So again, if someone had held a gun to your head, you could say it's about halfway in between. It wouldn't be horribly wrong by any means. But I like to have truth in advertising and just tell you that it's not halfway in between. And I'm just not going to ask you to find it. Okay? I think in lab we might actually actually do that. I can't remember. I, in the lab, I think you'll, you 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 look at this pattern, you measure where the bright spot is, and then you assume that it's halfway between the two dark ones. Okay. So, for the purposes I should say of web assign, homeworks, exams, things like that. I'm just going to ask you where the dark spots are. I'm not going to ask you anything else. Okay. So let me take a look at the features here. This is the big show right here. That is basically the only major important feature is this big central bright thing. It's the brightest thing and it's also the widest thing. Notice that if I were to describe 
the width of this central thing, I'll call it delta y for the central peak. I guess I'll call it delta y central. The width of that is actually 2 lambda l over w. This is central, if you can't read that, delta y sub central. The, the, the fact that m equals 0 got excluded actually made it twice as wide, because we kind of skipped a number there, right? We went from 1 here to minus 1 here. So that, that is not only brighter, but it's twice as wide as everybody else. So if you look at one of these guys, delta y of these I'll call some satellite peaks, these smaller peaks, they're only of width lambda l over w. So the big show in the middle, it's twice, it's, it's, it's twice as wide as all the other peaks, and it's the brightest. Okay? So this is really the most important thing. Question? Does it being twice as wide make it twice as bright? Uh, it's not generally uh, twice, you mean twice as bright as the next one or something? Like, yeah, twice the intensity. Uh, not necessarily. Um, it's more complicated than that, but it's significantly brighter. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not going to ask you to, to do that. It's, you know, I didn't tell you how the, they could make a partial comeback in the first place, so I can't really then tell you how to measure that intensity. Um, so that big show in the middle is oftentimes our main interest. Okay. So oftentimes I won't even bother to draw those satellite peaks. I might just draw it like this. So I might draw my slit here, that has a width w. I have my distance from the slit to the screen, l. I have lambda, of course, is the wavelength of light that I'm using. But the spread of the pattern, or the spread I can use to quantify, is this, which is delta y of the central thing. And notice that it can be significantly larger than the width of the thing itself, the width of the slit itself. Remember that light can bend around a corner. Or any wave, for that matter. Okay? So, oftentimes I don't bother to even draw in the satellite peak, simply because those are less intense and narrower. So this is kind of the big aspect of the pattern. Um, so this is this point where, I, again, tracking along with the two-slit stuff, I can compare sound and light and see um, when might you experience this phenomenon. You probably uh, experience this for sound. Here's an example. Let's say you have a doorway, and then you have a hall. So this is a door, open doorway, this is the hallway. And someone in their room is playing some music. Right? So um, that, those sound waves are going to diffract through that doorway opening. Here's what happens. So, you might have an intensity peak like this, and you can literally walk into that, right, or walk past that. So let's take a look at the parameters here. We'll notice that if the wavelength is larger, this is wider, okay? So you can notice here that if the wavelength is larger, then the width of that thing, that central thing, is wider. Now, if the wavelength is higher, what does that mean about the frequency? This decreases, right? So lower frequency, lower note, right? So a bass note, which has lower frequency, has larger wavelength, it should have a larger spread 
So if, for instance, this might be the spread of the treble, right? Let me draw in the spread of the bass frequencies. Of course, music has all sorts of frequencies, so the bass might go like this. That might be more spread out. This is the bass spread. Higher wavelength, higher spread. So have you ever walked down a hallway like this? walking by with your ears. Have you ever walked by and noticed the very first thing you hear is the bass and then only when you get in front of the doorway you hear a more crisp sound with more treble? Okay, That's because bass spins around corners much more easily. Bass diffracts easier. It's got a larger wavelength so it spreads out more going around barriers. Okay, Is this... anybody, anybody ever experience that? Okay. So that's, of course, uh, sound. But remember that our whole problem in light is that the wavelength is very low, right? So if you probably have never walked by a doorway and had different colors spread out differently. And that's because the spread is very low, right? So for light, the wavelength is very low. And so the, the spread is generally pretty low, OK? So probably if you've ever walked by a hallway, and someone's had a light bulb on, you get this, right? You just basically get the shadow of the, um, of the, the door there on the wall, right? There's no spread at all. There's no bending around the corners whatsoever. That is simply because light has such a low wavelength that the spread is basically none, right? So if we want to see this with light, which is a wave that just has a much, much smaller wavelength, we're going to have to do something to counteract that. Well, of course, what we do, if we want to get that central pattern to spread out, despite the very, very low wavelength of light, what do we have to do to L over W? We have to make it very large. So we have to have that L is big and W is small. Then we might get that that central uh, peak might spread out enough. So we really have to stack the odds in our favor if we want to see this phenomenon with light. We have to have that L is much, much greater than W. So the distance from the slit to the screen has to be like uh, perhaps a million times bigger than the width of the slit itself in order to counteract this small light wavelength. And that's exactly what I have, okay? When I have my uh, single slit here, the slit is narrower than the width of a human hair, okay? This is tiny compared to the distance from the slit to the screen, which here is probably several, several meters, right? So if I project it from here, to here, right? That's how I can get this pattern to spread out, because I'm concocting the geometry in my favor versus, of course, when you're talking about it, uh, the, if this is way too wide, right? The ratio of the slit width here to the length across the hallway might be one to one. I'm trying to make it be a million to one to get out of this hole of this wavelength, right? So you only would ever notice this with light if you really concocted the geometry so that these, this distance far outstripped this one, okay? Um, okay, so uh, the final thing, of course, I want to do is um, talk about why, why do I bring up the subject of uh, single slit effects or single slit interference? Well, it has a huge part in forming the double slit as well. So when you talk about a double slit, we are approximating that both slits are so narrow that they can only allow one wave. Well, of course, that's unrealistic for these two slits to be uh, infinitely narrow. If they were infinitely narrow, we would, of course, see our pattern across the wall forever and ever. But the reality of it is 
is that even though you have two slits which have a distance d apart, well, they both have their own finite width as well, okay? There's no way you can realistically make a slit without having it have some width. And if that's the case, then single slit effects appear in the double slit as well. And of course, single slit effects, we've learned that the uh, intensity dies off with distance. So that is what kills the double slit pattern for large angles anyway, and allows us to use a small angle approximation when we're talking about double slits, because single slit effects will kill the pattern anyway, going out from the center. So, uh, let me uh, compare and contrast. I have both the, uh, the double slit and the single slit with me, so I can um, show both of you side by side. So first, let me uh, show you the single slit again, just to remind you what that looks like. So here is the uh, single slit pattern. So that's the, notice that there's that big bright thing in the middle. It's, it's the brightest thing and it's twice as wide as all those satellite peaks that fade out gently, right? And now let me show you the double slit again. So here's the double slit pattern. If I can hold this steady, which I see, can't seem to do. So you do see the bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark right there, but notice that very clearly overlaid over it is that single slit pattern, right? So you can see that the, the alternating brights and darks toward the middle are the brightest. Then they kind of fade out, then they come back a little bit, and then they fade out again, right? So imposed on top of it is the single slit stuff. So that's why it isn't just a, a uniform alternating brightness and darkness going all the way from wall to wall. It does fade out because the single slit effects kill it. Because the reality of it is, is that even for a double slit, each slit has its own finite width, okay? So this kind of myth of uniform bright spots and dark spots alternating perfectly from wall to wall is not realistic. So a realistic pattern over here is what we observe, which is that uh, I can kind of draw as an envelope here. There are single slit effects that cause the fading out, and then the bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark happens dictated by that. Like so. Okay. So the alternating bright and dark from the double slit has superimposed on top of it this uh, single slit pattern as well. Um, okay, are there any questions on that? So again, I know the single slit effects, that's something that is, um, you know, in some sense it has some features that I couldn't justify at all, but hopefully I've very clearly delineated which ones those were so that um, you know what you don't need to know and kind of what you do. Um, so we have one final topic in what I'll call physical optics. This is where we're talking about wave interference, uh, constructive and destructive. The first topic that we did in physical optics was the two slit. The second was the single slit, which we did today. And then the final one is called thin film interference. So, um, first let me tell you, um, You've seen this phenomenon probably before. If you've ever uh, looked at a soap bubble, right? Someone blow a soap bubble and you notice there's colors in it. 
That's thin-film interference. If you've ever looked at an oil slick on the ground and noticed the rings of color, that's thin-film interference. So let's talk about how that works. So all this requires is having a very thin layer of something, which I'll call a film because oftentimes that's the, the thinness of, of it is best described as just like a thin veneer or film of something. Um, I think I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger just because otherwise I can't fit in all my stuff. But think of this as a very narrow thinning. So this is a film of a very narrow thickness and I'll call that T. I don't know why I call it T because it makes it look like time. Uh, many times you'll see it as D instead, but that's how all my notes are written. So you're going to have to take T equals thickness, it's not time. It's just measured in good old meters, or of course meters is probably not the best as a SI unit for distance, but typically these are micrometers or even nanometers thick, okay, thin films. So let's take a look at what happens. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send in incoming light at near normal incidence, which is just a fancy word of, way of saying that the angle is very small. Okay, so theta incident is approximately zero. The only reason I don't want to put it as exactly zero is that then all my drawing will just kind of fall on top of itself. So I need to draw in a relatively small angle just so that uh, my diagram is clear. So we know that when we uh, have an interface between two materials, in general, part of the light will bounce off, like so and part of the light will pass through. Now, you should of course be well aware that when you pass into a material, you may bend toward or away from the normal, right? That's one of the important things about refraction, right? Is that you bend toward the normal when you go into a higher end, and you bend away when you go into a smaller end, right? Here, I'm not even gonna bother to draw the bend because that's not where the action is. The reason why is we learned that when the angle is zero, the bending disappears. Well, we're at angles that are pretty close to zero, so the bending is basically minimal. That's not the action here, okay? All right, so now we have a second interface to deal with. Now we're in the film, uh, potentially passing back out, and at any given interface, it's possible to have some light that bounces off it and some light that passes through. The one exception, of course, we learned was total internal reflection, where you can just reflect, but that's not, we're not going to be even close to having that here, because remember that that requires a minimum angle called the critical angle, and we are at very small angles, definitely below the critical angle. Okay, well we can do this all day. Um, this one's going to go over here, and then this one, we're once again at the border of an interface between two materials, and generally speaking, some of it reflects and some of it passes through. And we can do this all day. Of course, realizing that we have diminishing returns, because for every light beam that goes away from the film, that takes energy with it, so the remaining light beam is of course gonna have less energy in it. So at this point, we fired in one light beam, and we have one, two, three different light beams that are heading off somewhere else, carrying, of course, energy with them, so this is diminishing returns. Um, I'm going to stop there because I have everything that I need for interference, because now I have two light beams that are going off in the original direction. So if I have an observer over here, where those beams can be observed, they, those beams may interfere. So I basically are, am cherry picking the very first two uh, light beams that are going to have different paths. The one that bounced off the top of the film, like so, and the one that went down into the bottom of the film and then bounced up again. Okay. So those are the two waves that I'm going to look at their interference. Well, 
we just pull out our old conditions, they are going to have different transit lengths. I'll call the transit difference in transit length is called the path difference. If that's a whole number of wavelengths, then we'll get constructive, no surprise. And if the path difference is instead a whole number of wavelengths plus an extra half, then we'll get destructive, no surprises. So, um, the path difference here is really easy to compute. Let's say that this is the path of, of uh, light one, this is the path of light two. So they both start off somewhere over here. This is the initial point, and then this is the final point for light one, and this is the final point for light two. Basically, everything they did was the same, except that light two always travels a bit longer, right? Because it went down to the bottom of the film and back. Notice, by the way, that they don't ever take turns, right? If they don't ever take turns, one being longer and one being shorter. That was the issue with the uh, double slit, right? If we were more toward the for slit one, that traveled longer, and if we were more toward slit two, uh, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. If you're closer to slit one, slit two, you have to travel longer, and if you're closer to slit two, then one has to travel longer, right? This one, if we label them like this, two always travels longer. And about how much longer is it? 2T, Two T. Two T, right? Down to the bottom of the film and back. Now, again, you might be worried about the sideways distance, but remember, we're doing almost near normal incidence, so this is basically just down and back. So this is approximately equal to 2t. And since the uh, path difference, we don't let them alternate in terms of which one is longer, we also have no need then for negative integers either. Remember, the whole point of negative integers in the two-slit was so that we could have a negative path difference. So we don't need negative integers now. All right, so uh, we're pretty much done. Um, here are our two equations. Um, let me put them in the same order I did before. 2t equals m lambda, that's your constructive. 2t equals m plus a half lambda is your destructive. So, how might you use these? Well, you have a couple different options, and these are just different ways that uh, homework and exam questions are phrased. One option is to so, first of all, you have to look in the, in the question for a hint, is are you interested in constructive or destructive, right? So, if you see reinforced or brighter or something like that, those are buzzwords to tell you which one are you interested in. Constructive or destructive. Constructive, you see brighter or reinforced. If you see something like suppressed or dark or things like that, then you're looking for the destructive, right? So that's number one in your problem, is to figure out which one are you interested in. Look for buzzwords of which one do you care about. Then, from there, you have two different options, and these are just, again, just like any physics problem. Some problems give you variable x and ask you for y, some give you y and ask for x. One of the things they could do is tell you what wavelength of light you're working with, right? So they hand you, your well, light is this wavelength. Then. Let's say you're interested in constructive and they give you the wavelength. You can plug in all the m values and get a set of thicknesses that would constructively interfere with that light wavelength, right? So this is a whole series. So you could say this set of thicknesses will uh, constructively interfere with this light wavelength. Or the opposite is they could tell you we're interested in constructive. Here's your thickness. What's the set of wavelengths that would be constructively interfered by that thickness, right? So then you plug in all your m values and solve for a set of wavelengths. That's actually nicer because, of course, any integer will work. So you'll have an infinite set of 
uh, uh, an infinite list. You'll have either an infinite list of thicknesses at a given wavelength or an infinite set of wavelengths at a given thickness. But if you look for buzzwords, visible wavelengths, right? Because even if you have an, a, a long list of wavelengths, they will not all be visible. So you just start writing out the sequence, and when you pass out of the visible range, stop writing, because you're done with the question. If they're asking for what wavelengths in, are in the visible range that are constructively interfered by a, a film of such and such thickness, just write out, start writing out the set, and when you have passed through the visible range, stop, right? You have your list. Okay? So while there might be an infinitely long list of wavelengths that are constructively interfered, say, by a certain thickness, only a certain subset of these values will produce visible wavelengths. Okay? So that's how these questions are often structured. Okay? So that's, that's the, the general gist. So first, I guess, step one, figure out if you're interested in constructive or destructive. Step two, you'll either be given the thickness and ask for, or I guess, given the wavelength and ask for the thickness. So there may be a whole set of these thicknesses, or there is a whole set of these thicknesses. Sometimes we'll just ask you for the minimum thickness, right? So just write down the smallest one. You can't put type in an infinite set into WebAssign, so it has to frame it in some way, right? Or the other option is that you'll be given the thickness and you're asked for the wavelength. Maybe they ask you for the minimum wavelengths, or as I mentioned, maybe they will just ask you to identify which of the, that set of wavelengths is visible. Okay? So that's the kind of general strategy for these problems. They all kind of go just like that. Now, there is, however, two modifications we have to make to this scheme, one of which is a very minor one, and the other one which is a little bit more in involved. Th these equations need two modifications before they're really ready to be put out into the, into the world, okay? before you're really ready to apply them to a homework problem. So the first one is this. We're of course saying, look, ultimately where this uh, stuff is coming from is that the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths if you get constructive, or if the path difference is a whole number of wavelengths plus an extra half is destructive. But the question is, uh, whole number of what wavelength? Or whole number plus a half of what wavelength? Well, the the path difference is made here in the film, right? That's where we have to worry if you fit, say, two wavelengths or three wavelengths or three and a half wavelengths, right? If, if in the film this travels two extra wavelengths, it'll still line up with its thing it's interfering with. But if in the film it travels two and a half wavelengths, then it'll kill it, uh, the other one, when it gets out, right? So this is where I remind you that wavelengths change when you enter different materials. The wavelength might look like this out here, and then look like this in here. Remember, wavelength compresses. Of course, when it comes out, it'll go back to the original. But we're interested in when, it, when it's in the film, is that a whole number of wavelengths, or is that a whole number of wavelengths plus an extra half? So the modification, the first modification we have to make is that when we say the wavelength here, we mean the wavelength in the film. So the first modification is that the wavelength that we are interested in is whatever wavelength it has while it's making that path difference, while one of the waves is traveling 2t extra than the other one. Now you have to be really careful to always use that wavelength, especially because the way that the problems are phrased, they actually on it often ask what incoming wavelengths are interfered. So they will ask you, they will give you what lambda naught is sent in, and ask you over here when it's back to being lambda naught, what will be interfered, in what way, but you have to 
actually modify it first before you put it in here. Okay, so before you actually put it in the equation, you have to use a different wavelength than the one you're being sent that's being sent in and that you're being asked about interfering over here. Okay, so that's one thing. Are there any questions on that before I tell you the other modification? Okay, so be aware that often lambda naught is either given or asked about, but you have to use lambda n. So that's the first modification. The second modification, well, to clear a little space because it's a little more involved. The second modification, there is something that happens to light when it reflects. Now, of course, by the time we got to law of reflection, our light was already a ray, so we weren't drawing the waviness of it all. We just showed it bouncing off like this. So we never had opportunity to ask, well, what happens to the wavy part of the wave? Well, something happens. Um, in order to motivate what, what happens here, I'm going to actually show you that this is a phenomenon that can be found in any type of wave. Um, a wave that you might be more familiar with would be like a wave on a string, like a wave on a clothesline. So, a wave on a clothesline Let's say you have like some kind of rope and you send a wave and you send it at some uh, boundary where the rope is tied down. So this is what we call a fixed boundary because of course the rope is tied down and can't move. What happens is when it bounces off, it inverts. So you have inversion of the wave upon reflection. Now, I don't want to get too much into the details of why that happens, but I will try to convince you that it must happen. There is a reason, because if a crest is coming in to the, to the wall, a trough has to be emerging, because what's a crest plus a trough? What is it? Flat line, zero. Why is it that the point there where the string is tied to the wall, why does that, ha why does that have to be zero? Because it's tied down, right? So the kind of reasoning argument is that the, the wave has to invert upon reflection because the sum of the wave that's going into the wall and the sum of the wave coming out of the wall has to add up to zero because the string is actually not allowed to move there. I talk about this in Physics 1 as well. So well, we did something called standing waves, and we talk about the uh, wave bouncing off a, off a, um, off a, uh, 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 a fixed boundary like that. Um, it creates what's called a node, if you remember that from Physics 1. Um, so uh, in our case here, if that doesn't ring a bell at all, just believe me that when a wave hits a fixed boundary like this, it flips around and comes back at you the opposite way. Uh, so, um, what about if it wasn't fixed? Could you do that? Well, yeah, you could do that. If you had a wave on a string, and instead of tying it to the wall, you could put a little ring on it, and then put that ring around the pole, like that, and that is what I call a free boundary. So then when the crest gets to the wall, it just simply has to lift the ring up the pole. And what you actually find is that then, if it lifts the ring up the pole, that means that it's a crest, and then it will just reflect back as a crest. So there is no inversion. Oops. Oh. So there is no inversion. So it really depends when a light or when a wave reflects 
It depends on the conditions that it experiences when it uh, reflects what it does. Does it invert or not invert? Let me show you the equivalent for light. So for light, we'll again, we'll put the border between two surfaces. The equivalent of a fixed boundary is when we go from a smaller n to a higher n. So you can think of that as kind of like a hard wall, sort of, right, as far as light speaking. We're talking about a medium in which light moves much more easily, and then it's going into a medium where light has a much harder time uh, moving, and it moves significantly slower, right? Higher end value is slower speed. So if you send in a crest to this kind of interface, well, we of course learn that the light will both reflect and refract, but the reflected beam will invert. So it inverts. I like to call this a hard reflection, because it's a hard boundary. You're in a smaller end bouncing off a larger end. If you're worried about where the uh, refracted beam goes, of course, it was part of the light that's also refracted. But th there's no flipping ever for the refraction. It's only for reflection, OK? There's no, did I say that right? There's no flipping ever for the part that goes through refraction. There can be flipping for the reflected, OK? In this case, it will invert. Um, you could also have the opposite case, where you're already in a higher end, bouncing off a lower end, which is easier to move through. And if you send in a crest, to such a, a boundary. Of course, in general, light will partly reflect, partly refract. The part that goes through will never flip, and in this case, the part that bounces off does not invert. Okay, so no inversion. I'll call this what a, a soft reflection. So those are the equivalents in our situation. So what we're interested in to see if we have to worry about this inversion upon reflection is characterizing the end values that are happening. Okay? So we have to look at the end values involved and see how does this potentially affect us. Of course, ignorance was bliss before, so now we have to go back and re-examine the situation. So let's suppose that we have a thin film and we have that the n values get progressively smaller. So I'll call it n1, n2, n3. Okay. So the, basically we are coming in from the highest end. We are bouncing off the top of the film. We have part of the light going into the film, the end value of the film is somewhere in between, and then the lowest end value is on the far side. So let's reevaluate. Okay, so we have two reflections here that we have to analyze because both of the beams in the interference did one bounce. Okay. Um, so the first one, the one that bounced off the top of the film, was that a hard or a soft reflection? This one right here. It's a soft. You're in a higher end, bouncing off a smaller end. You're in N1, bouncing off N2. So that is a soft reflection, so no inversion, right? So this was a soft reflection. Okay, what about the one that bounces off the bottom of the film, right? It's in N2, bouncing off N3. Is that a hard or a soft? Soft. Okay, so no inversion whatsoever, right? Ignorance is bliss there. We didn't even know that you could invert upon reflection. In this case, neither one happens to. So we just use the formulas exactly as prescribed, right? So if I make myself a little chart here. 2t equals m lambda, right? A whole number of wavelengths in the path difference. And over here, 2t equals m plus a half lambda. Let's make ourselves a little chart. Well, if you have a soft, soft, 
Well then, we don't even have to worry about inversion. So, of course, this will be constructive, as we said before, and this will be your destructive. So no big deal. Haven't seen any big, any result from this potential inversion upon reflection yet, because they don't have any yet. All right? Well, let's try the other cases. Of course, soft, soft is only one permutation. So let me try another one. Let me try that the n value gradually increases. I'll, I can give you a nice example of this one. Air, oil, and the ground. Or water, if you want. We're looking at an oil slick on the ground. The progression of n values is from low to high. So if we bounce, we're in air and we bounce off oil, what kind of reflection is that? That's a hard. So we get a flip, right? Part of the light goes into the oil and bounces off the ground. What kind of reflection is that? Also hard, right? They're both going to flip. So let's take a look here. So we, they would have lined up before previously, right? If they wouldn't line up previously and they both flip upside down, do they still line up? Yep. So again, ignorance is bliss. We could use the formula that we had before. No problem. Because if they both flip, then they don't flip relative to each other, right? So we can also use this for hard hard. Basically, anytime you have light reflections, they're either they're both do the same thing. So either neither of them flip, or they both flip, so they don't flip relative to each other, then all is well. But, again, that's just for light reflections. Let, we should probably look at what happens with unlike reflections. So let me draw a case like that. Um, what about if we had small n Big N, back to small N. And I'll give you a classic example of this. This is a soap bubble. We have air. We have the soap bubble. And we're back to air again. There's air on both sides. So if we're in air, bouncing off the uh, bubble, which is basically soapy water, what kind of reflection is that? Is that soft or hard? hard? That's hard, right? Wow, this is big. It's a hard. All right? But part of the light passes into the bubble and reflects off the air on the other side. So if you're in the bubble bouncing off air, what kind of reflection is that? That's soft. So now one way flips and the other one doesn't. So let's figure out what the heck do we do now that one way flips and the other one doesn't. So here we have everything all set to line up, right? We have a whole number of wavelengths in the path difference. Everything's all set to line up, right? But one of the waves flips. So what happens now? They're going to instead perfectly kill each other. So they used to line up crest on crest, trough on trough, but one of the waves, upon reflecting, got flipped upside down. So now everything that was perfectly set to be constructive is now going to be perfectly destructive. What if they were, would have otherwise been perfectly destructive, but then one of the waves flips? What's going to happen now? They're going to be constructive now. So all that happens here is that the two formulas just reverse their purpose. This used to be all set to be constructive, but the extra flip of one of the waves makes it destructive. 
And over here, when they would have been perfectly lined up to kill each other, instead, they're constructed. It just reverses the rules of the equation play. So this is any time where you have a, a soft hard or a hard soft, Basically, the overarching thing is, of course, that the two are do different things. One flips and the other one doesn't. So for light reflections, use the formulas as we would have previously represented. But remember, when you have unlike reflections, you need to reverse which one was which. Okay? So that would be the extra step to add into the problem-solving strategy. So first, figure out what you're interested in. Is the problem asking for constructive or destructive? Then sketch out the end values and figure out which of these you have, you have like or unlike, so that you know which equation you should use for the whatever you're interested in. And then, of course, they're either going to give you thickness, give you the thickness, ask for wavelengths, or give you the wavelength and ask for thicknesses. Okay? Um, that's how all of these thin film problems are going to go. Um, so, um, I mentioned already, you can use it, this is why we have colors and oil slicks. The reason why you see the colors is because the color is basically a map of thickness, right? The different thickness, where the spots are different thicknesses, they, they um, treat uh, certain colors more constructively or destructively. And then, um, same thing here with an oil, or with a soap bubble. Um, one of the applications that I have you look at on the homework is anti-reflective coating in glasses. So if you you'll go, you wear eyeglasses, they always say, hey, do you want anti-reflective coating on this? Right, it's a little extra. So that makes it, it's just cosmetic, so that when someone's talking to you, they don't just see light bouncing off the light picture, they can actually see your eyes, right? So what they do is that they put a very thin coating on top of your, the glass, and they pick a wavelength right in the middle of the visible spectrum. And they make sure that that gets destructively interfered so that when light bounces off the front of your glasses, it's not, uh, it's, it's killed so people can actually then see the light coming through from your eyes. Uh, a more, uh, a less cosmetic application of that is for the sights that go on uh, sniper rifles. So if you're a sniper, you don't want the glint of your scope to give away your position. So you put some anti-reflective coating on that um, so that um, you can suppress visible wavelengths that are bouncing off of the, the, your sight on your rifle or whatever. Okay, so let's call it a day there. That's the end of thin film interference and that's the end of physical optics. Um, on Thursday I'll do some uh, modern physics, uh, which is also on homework 10, and then on Tuesday I'll do some more on mirrors and lenses to finish that unit up.